How much TV did you watch as a kid? It's an important question tonight. Or a fun one, uh, philosophy. I love the study of philosophy because it is this wide ranging. And Dr. Felicia Nimua Ackerman from Brown University will be my guest tonight. She wrote an op-ed piece that I read in the Providence Journal a little while back about her experiences as a kid and her parents saying, you're not gonna watch television. And how it helped her, how it hurt her, and then her uh, common sense deliberation about it. I think you'll find it fascinating on television. Welcome in. My state of mind is here because I am Dan York. That's what the thing says underneath. Um, I got some thoughts on things going on in the world, which is what we do here normally each weeknight, 7.30, 11.30 on my RITV. So let's dig in before we get to our guest segment today. There's a lot of things in the news, and this is the only thing that matters. Although I will tell you that uh, by midday, I think the sports talk radio audience was probably the only place that had full phone lines on this. I think a lot of folks are like, really? I don't know. But it's a follow story of major proportions, no doubt. This is the new concept with the Paw Sox deal. Forget what we've been saying. Let's start from the beginning. Hmm. The biggest problem that Rhode Islanders face? I don't know. But pollsters have found out, at least those from Bryant and Joe Fleming, who polls for WPRI, of course. We'll talk to you about those numbers. And uh, they love the ocean race. Newport, real fans. They were up late last night. And have you seen the video of the Pope? with his uh, basketball buddies. Your state of mind is important to us, and we'll check in with you on that. All right, let's dig in. I have a conversation here. Deflate or frame gate? You know, it was deflate gate, but now Tom Brady's dad has renamed it. Here's the headline in USA Today. Uh, he was vehemently defending his son, and who wouldn't expect that? You know how the story goes, right? Here's CBS's quick wrap of it. Don Yee called the 243-page document by attorney Ted Wells a terrible disappointment, containing significant and tragic flaws, omitting key facts. The investigation found it is more probable than not that Tom Brady was at least generally aware of the inappropriate activities involving the release of air from Patriots game balls. No comment from locker room attendant Jim McNally, who is accused of deflating the balls, or equipment assistant John Jastrzemski, who apparently exchanged incriminating text messages with Brady. Brady is scheduled to appear at Salem State University tonight, with many wondering what, if anything, he will have to say about all this. Now, at press time, we record this broadcast nightly at 4 o'clock-ish in the afternoon, so I don't know if Tom's going to say anything, so we'll be able to react to that in future shows, no doubt. But the, you know what's interesting about this, this whole story, seems to me, that if the league, I mean, the, the idea here from Dad, Framegate, and his agent as well, they're trying to say, look, if the league was objective about this and really was worried about the integrity of the AFC Championship contest, then they would have redoubled their efforts to check the inflation rate of these balls or put some other practices or protocols in to assure that they were on spec. Instead, based on a previous game with the Indianapolis Colts and a little bit of a, of a nudge from the Colts in the first half of the AFC Championship game, they then investigated as, as if they were waiting for the crime to occur, if you will. Now, you know, police officers use that technique all the time, but it does present a pretty interesting debate. Of course, that debate will be around, but it will be diminished when the NFL finally comes out with its discipline, if any, for Tom Brady. And then, if there is, and if it's substantial, it'll hit the fan all over the place. Fascinating. Even though it's not the most important thing in the world, it, it dominates everybody's water cooler conversation, no doubt. So the Paw Sox have been serious water cooler conversation uh, for quite some time now. I've been telling you over the last few days and nights, days on the radio on WPRO, weekdays noon to 3, and here on the television on my RITV, 730 and 1130, that the Speaker of the House was taking a front and center role now in the Paw Sox negotiations, evidenced by this headline. The speaker speaking about, they had a Democratic caucus yesterday to kind of cover some issues in the legislative session. 
And I guess the last thing on the agenda was a conversation about the Paw Sox. And I guess the speaker reportedly told the members of the caucus, meaning most of your state representatives, that they ought to look at this thing from a neutral point of view, as if no deal was on the table. Which is kind of hard for everybody since the ask has been made by the Paw Sox for a net $4 million a year paid by the state to the team in addition to free land and no taxes for the building they're going to build, which could be financed by the money paid by the state. Now, the Paw Sox have been kind of timid about saying, yeah, we're going to restart this conversation. If they really meant to change public opinion, which they have managed to turn against them somehow, who would ever think that the Paw Sox would be in negative public opinion? But Ben Mondor is God, rest his soul, gone, and the new ownership have performed that miracle. But if they were really concerned about changing the dynamic in the public, they would have had another press conference and said, forget the first idea, we're working on a second. But Nick Mattiello looks like he's got the whole thing figured out. This is a different issue. We're not issuing bonds. This is a company that's already been in Rhode Island for 50 years. This is one of 30 AAA franchises across the country. They're affiliated with the Boston Red Sox. What fear do you have that they're not going to be around in the next 10, 20, 30, or 100 years? They'll be here. It's just a different analysis, and we have to look at it for what it is. <laughs> uh, obviously, he's asking, uh, answering a question that seemed to be based on 38 studios and that debacle, right? Uh, I know what it is. It's a serious franchise with a lot of goodwill, hopefully still to be maintained here in the state. But what you see more than anything else is what I've been telling you, and that is that the speaker's role is becoming more prominent in this negotiation. He's hired his own consultant, who's already kind of thumbsed up this deal in concept. And what you're going to see is the governor play more and more of the devil's advocate role. How the whole thing turns out between those two branches of government is anybody's guess. But if you were betting and you had some free cash, bet that this session they're going to make a deal with the Paw Sox. All right. Biggest problem we face in Rhode Island just in general? Well, the Hasenfeld Institute came out with a poll, and it asked all sorts of public policy questions. But I found this one most intriguing. Gary Sass from the Hasenfeld Institute uh, commissioned this, and Joe Fleming, the guy who does the Channel 12 polls, did the poll. Most important problem for Rhode Islanders? Job opportunities at 30 percent. Clearly the biggest choice from the polled personnel of Rhode Island. Taxes... Second, government corruption is making a, making a strong showing there at 14%, and government spending, always a concern. And then trailing were the, uh, you know, leadership issues, public school performance, cost of health care, and some people were just like, blah, 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 I don't know how to answer that question. Uh, it's kind of good for Gina Raimondo, right? Because she ran on jobs, 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 and she's talking, talking about jobs, jobs, jobs. Not so good for Gina Raimondo, she doesn't deliver. Because if she doesn't deliver, that number goes from 30 to a high number very quickly. So it's all on her. The honeymoon is soon to be over. Uh, nice night last night in Newport. We've had some fine spring weather, don't you think? The headline on the Volvo race. Yes, that's a dark night in Newport, and it certainly was. People are lining up all along Fort Adams to see these boats come in and dock. We met this couple who came with their baby forest. We knew this was going on in town, so we figured it would be a fun thing to, to do. We'll watch the finish of the sixth leg of the Volvo Ocean Race. Newport is the race's only stop in North America. The race started in October, launching from Spain, and they'll be sailing across the world for nine months before finishing in Sweden. The village they created here in Newport will be open until May 17th. That's when the boats leave and head toward Portugal. Pretty cool. 3.30 in the morning, the last boat came in. 3.30 in the morning, and there was still a big crowd out there. There is no doubt that we've established ourselves as a big sailing community. And it's a big economic opportunity. Good stuff. This is better stuff. Have you seen this video? It speaks for itself. It hardly needs any commentary. Just put this on my list today, and I was happy to see it. Yes, that is he, the Pope. Oh, I can't do that either. Try it again. He got his own jersey. My big question is, you know, when he's in his room, does he put that thing on? Does he shoot some hoops? You know what? He's casual enough uh, to do all of that. Don't you love Pope Francis? You know, some people ask the question chronically in their lives, what would Jesus do? Jesus would do that, and he'd play. No doubt in my mind. 
Your state of mind is important to us. Call us with a voicemail reaction to anything we've said or somebody else says on this show at 228-1886. Email me at stateofmind.myratv.com. Tweet and Facebook post at Dan York Show. Don't forget the E so it goes through. Here's a thought from one of our viewers. On your 5-5 show, you did a segment on Matty Yellow hiring his own economist to advise him on the merits of the public financing for a new baseball stadium. Are you aware the economist hired has publicly supported the deal in an article on R-I-P-R dot, I believe, Rhode Island Public Radio if you're scoring at home. Yeah, I've been saying that. Aren't you paying attention, George? The speaker wants to be able to say, hey, I got my own consultant, and he wants to move this deal forward. Hey, listen, I'm bullish about a stadium in Providence, too, if the numbers are right. But no that uh, all of this is loading up that the General Assembly will play the heavyweight role in this negotiation. And that's the way it is. How much TV did you watch when you were a kid? Fascinating conversation, I hope, coming up. Stay with us. You know, we love interesting people on this program, and when I read this op-ed piece, I thought, wow, what a great conversation. Throw it up there. No howdy-doody time in my family. But you don't seem to be that upset about it, Professor. Well, as a child I was upset about it. It would be a rather peculiar thing to be upset about at age 67. As I said in the column, it didn't do me any long-term harm, but it made my childhood worse. And I would like to say, suggest in general that deprivation is not a good thing unless you expect to gain something from it. And unless you have good reason to suppose that something your children want to do is harmful, why not let them pursue happiness? Dr. Felicia Nimua Ackerman. And what's interesting about your name is that those that's not a middle name. Nimua is, it's a double first name like Mary Jane. Right. So Felicia Nimua is my first name. Ackerman is my last name. What does Nimua mean? Nimua is from Mallory's Mort Darthur, and it doesn't really mean anything. I named myself, by the way. I changed my, my original middle name is Felicia, and I changed my name legally in 2007. Parents always, except I guess for I'm a hog's father, mean well when they name their children, but they have nothing to go by. So you're quite likely to get stuck with a name you don't like. Why not change it? That's what I did. Were they around to know you did? My mother was. My father wasn't. What was her reaction? She figured I was doing what I wanted to do. <laughs> you are a philosophy professor. I would think, my, my guess is, is that your class is popular. I think I'm not the person to judge. Something tells me that this is a fun exercise to talk about things of philosophy. You're very literature-based, right, with, with what you do? My courses are really very close to literature. I discuss a great deal of philosophical themes in fiction. That's not the only thing I do, but many of my courses center around that. There's one course called Ethical Themes of the Contemporary American Short Story, for example, where we use short stories as vehicles for philosophical discussion. And I think, you know, I don't know if we'll have time for that today, but hopefully we'll have you back to talk about that stuff. Let's, let's dig a little bit more into the reason that you wrote this uh, this piece about television and young people and back in, in the day. I mean, today, kids are just in everything. I mean, everything is an iPad or an iPhone. Everybody's watching video. It's as if if you don't have a video opportunity in your palm, you are panicked. I had a similar column about the internet called, it was in the journal, called Why Johnny Shouldn't Read, which said that if your child is reading, this has such dreadful things as he's sedentary, which is contributing to obesity, and he's not outside learning to love nature, and he's engaged in a solitary activity, and he's outside of your control, and he may become addicted. And I said, are you really going to keep your kids from reading for this sort of reason? Do these arguments sound familiar? They're just the sorts of arguments people use against the Internet. In general, I think the Internet is way too demonized. Of course, it's possible to spend too much time in cyberspace, 23 hours a day, the way it's possible to spend too much time doing virtually anything. But in general, I'm very wary of parents who restrict their kids' online use unless the, something is obviously wrong with the kid. What exactly is so terrible about spending a lot of time online? You're in touch with people all over the world. I'm thinking. I'm thinking. We're allowed to take time to think on this show. I'm Wonderful. thinking. I'm thinking about what that means. So contrast that with what you experienced as a young person. Your, your, your parents had a philosophical 
argument against having a television It was house. odd because in most respects they were very liberal and once we had a TV they were shocked that anybody would restrict anyone's watching time and I said but we didn't have a TV at all before. I think they were you know like most people as I said in the column somewhat inconsistent they had an aversion to television it was everything they didn't like about popular culture and I think they hadn't really thought through that there were all sorts of things you could get through reading or through movies that they might not approve of either and that they didn't really in general want to restrict what I did and what I thought about so we didn't have a TV until I was in ninth grade and we were required to watch the Huntley Brinkley report and then we got one and once you broke through with the Hunt, uh, the Hunt, Hunt, Huntley Brinkley report, it was pretty much uh, Pandora's box had been opened. You can watch anything you wanted to. Um, yeah, they didn't put any restrictions on it. But as I said in the column, I didn't have either of the extreme results. I didn't hardly ever watch because I had been inoculated against it, and I didn't watch constantly. I watched about 12 hours a week. I watched American Bandstand. I watched TV crime shows, and it was fun. Why deprive someone of that kind of fun? You write in a column that you, you know, you were over at your, uh, your friends' places, and they had the television. And how did that go? As I mentioned, my friends didn't see any particular reason to watch TV while I was over because they could watch it any time. So I didn't get to watch TV that much at my friend's house because that wasn't why we had they had me over. The programs I did see, as I said in the column, I wasn't crazy about, but I didn't like being left out of all the conversations about TV. Now, nowadays, perhaps in progressive schools like the one I went to with a delightful name, the Brooklyn Ethical Culture School, no kidding, people would be micromanaging our conversations and making sure that nobody felt left out. Thank God they weren't doing that. I don't think that's the solution. I don't think teachers should be telling kids what to talk about so no one will feel bad. But in fact, my not having a television kept me out of these conversations with no long-term compensating benefit. It didn't do me huge harm, but it didn't do me any good. So why inflict that sort of deprivation on anyone? You know, everything that we experience in childhood sets a foundation for our philosophies in life, doesn't it? Almost. I wouldn't say everything a lot does. Of I would say some things probably do. So your philosophy on internet comes from your learning experience with television. Now, it comes partly from that, but it also comes from the personality I brought to the experience to begin with. Many people react differently to the very same sort of experience. For example, the elementary school I went to with that delightful name, the Brooklyn Ethical Culture School, I experienced as extremely snoopy and intrusive, but other students like that sort of thing. So it's not just a matter of what your experience is, but it's also a matter of what sort of person you are and how you interpret it. Is there an overall parental guide or message that you are trying to send with this story you told about lack of television? I guess so, but I've never had kids, so I'm making this mainly from the standpoint of a consumer of child care. That is someone who got it. And it's basically, hmm. if you have, as, as I said in the column, as the Rolling Stones pointed out, you can't always get what you want. You can't always get your kids what they want. Maybe what they want costs too much money. Maybe it takes up too much time. Maybe it's apt to be harmful. But the default position should be let kids do what they want unless there's a good reason not to. And sometimes there will be a good reason not to. But I'm not sure there's a good reason not to have a television in your home the way there would be a good reason, for example, not let, to let your kids oh, snort cocaine. I mean, that's obviously not a good thing to have kids do. All right, well, we, we, we have to pause, but I, I, don't think this is a, I don't think this is a small matter. I don't either. As somebody who has parented and is still parenting, this gives me pause. Stay with us. You know, the wonderful world of philosophy uh, is so broad, but this, this column that you really, ought to, by the way, it appeared on April 28th in, in the journal, so go online and read it. Uh, no howdy duty time in my family. The professor uh, I, it says something here uh, you, uh, about, listen, don't prevent your kids or, or, depri or deprive your kids of things for the sake of it. You know, sometimes as a parent, you get on a roll. You get on a no roll. Like no, 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 no. I think our, I, I think we've got a lot of we, we we've been on a yes roll in a lot of ways, and you know I remember the old you might have had it when you were looking for your TV and you didn't get it. You know, 
Well, Johnny has it, or Mary has it. Well, Johnny told you to jump over a bridge, would you do it? I mean, that kind of old-fashioned parenting that I got. I try not to repeat the cliches that my parents, who were wonderful, brought to me. But it is a great exercise, I think, that you're bringing in reading this and, and, and saying, listen, don't, for, don't do it for the sake of, right? Don't find a reason to prevent your children from doing something. It requires thinking. I think parents go on auto mode too much, right? Yes, but I think I'm also saying not even so much look for a reason. Unless you already have a reason, let your kids pursue happiness. The obvious answer to would you jump off the bridge if Johnny told you, a smart kid will say, what I'm asking you to let me do is not as bad as jumping off a bridge. There isn't the same reason for not doing it. Watching television is not like jumping off a bridge. You know, I, I don't like it when the guest is smarter than me. <laughs> well, then I don't think you have to worry because I doubt that I am smarter than you. <laughs> no, but, I, but the, the, the practice of common sense thinking it requires a little bit of discipline of thought, doesn't it? Sure. And, and sometimes, look, I think parenting is, is the greatest thing that you can do in the world. Well, I don't, and I chose not to have children, so that's another way we differ. Why do you say that? because that's what I believe. I think there are many things you can do that are just as good as being a parent. You can have deep relationships with adults. You can learn. You can do things to help other people. Some people want to spend time with children and some people don't, just the way people vary okay, in all sorts of other ways. Okay, let me reposition you. If you are a parent... Then you better do a good job. Then it might have to be the most important thing you do. Never having been a parent, I want to be careful about commenting on that, but I must say I do have my doubts. I would certainly hope that you regard your relationship with your spouse as being at least as important. I once read an interview with a couple, in fact, I think they were on an Israeli kibbutz, and the man who was, I guess, about 65 said they spent an hour a day with their grandchildren, and of course that was the most delightful part of his day, and I thought, gee, I'm glad I'm not his wife. I want my husband to think the most delightful part of his day was with me. So while if you're a parent, you should take it seriously, the same way if you're a teacher, you should take it seriously, or a doctor, or a policeman, I'm not sure that it has to be the most important thing in your life rather than just one of the most important things in your life. So perhaps I was overstating and somewhat undisciplined with my thought, because you're, you're right-sizing me here a little bit. I still think that what I am taking from your work is to think about what you want to think about before you just act, say, sure. or do. And, that, and that, that's important in parenting because I think too many times we're acting on past experience, past behavior, uh, we always do it this way type of thing, and that's not healthy. I think that's true virtually everywhere. Thank not God. Just Stop talking. I got, a, I, got an, I, got a, I got some agreement. <laughs> I guess I do want to say, though, that not everything obviously requires a great deal of thought. You don't have to spend hours deciding between chocolate and vanilla ice cream. Just take the one you like, chocolate. Oh, my goodness. Um, you promise you'll come back? I would love to. On, on certain themes? Because Anything you like. Uh, what a pleasure. I would take your class. I would love to have you. You know what? I might in visit. Fact, you may. I'm on leave that? this term, but feel free to come in the fall. Okay. One more thing when we come back. Stay with us. You know, I don't watch this show. I do this show. I'm going to watch this show. That's a top five guest that we just had. She, uh, Dr. Felicia Nimua Ackerman, philosophy professor at Brown. You know, you know what? She's good because she's thinking all the time. And some of us, including me, are talking rather than thinking. See you on the radio tomorrow. Talk and think some more on WPRO and back here at 730 tomorrow night.